Hello, good evening. Um, I hope everybody's well. Uh, welcome to uh, this Conway Hall event, uh, not taking place in Conway Hall, currently taking place in Liverpool, uh, in Kent, and in a shed in Lewisham. Welcome to Conway Hall in quarantine. Um, this is part of our series Ethical Mondays, which is uh, continues Conway Hall's mission to put on talks that look at ways of making the world a better place and people living a better life uh, goes along with our uh, other programme, Thinking on Sunday, among other things that Conway Hall do. It's our charitable mission to bring thought-provoking talks to the public. So, welcome. Uh, how this evening is going to go is uh, Jack will speak for about 45 minutes or so on uh, his book, Now That I Have Your Attention, and his researches and thoughts from that. Uh, if you have a question or comment, do please um, put it into the Q&A bubble, which is at the bottom of your screen, and then we will invite you to, um, you can either, we can either read out your question ourselves, or you, we could open up your microphone and um, ask us, and we can, you can ask the question directly of Jack. Um, let us know what you prefer to do, question and comment. And um, if you don't put, we'll try and open up your microphone, so let us know. Um, and so, I think that's everything. Yeah, that's everything. Um, we will be recording this talk and it will appear in our YouTube in due course as well. So you should watch it again or share it with other people. Um, so the talk this evening, uh, Jack Shanker has been traveling the UK speaking to grassroots organizations, something that we found fascinating here and wanted to book him in for this talk. Uh, Jack is an award-winning reporter on radical politics and protest, and he's been shortlisted for the Orwell Prize uh, he's written for a number of publications, Graza, The Guardian, um, and The New York Times, and his other book is The Egyptians, A Radical Story. So uh, do please welcome to Ethical Mondays, uh, Jack Shankar, speaking on Now That We Have Your Attention, We're about to give him our attention. Uh, thank you very much, Scott, for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone who's taken time out to join us this evening. I, I want to apologize in advance for any hiccups in my video stream. Uh, and just to explain where I am for complicated reasons, I'm currently staying in a fairly bleak patch of peri-urban wasteland overlooking the Thames estuary. Uh, I mean, it has its charms, I hasten to add, but I'm struggling with a dodgy internet connection. I guess in many ways, uh, it actually feels like a highly appropriate setting from which to meditate on the state of British politics right now. About half a mile in front of me is a series of boggy marshes, which are littered with unexploded ordnance and uh, so really the metaphors just write themselves fingers crossed the 4g network holds up and you're able to hear me uh, okay but do just let me know if there's any technical problems we live in an age of crisis it fills the air around us it seeps into all the cracks the so-called great moderation of the 1990s and 2000s, a period in which many influential figures began to speak of the end of history, the final triumph of free market liberalism, a world in which ideology was dead and the only political struggle remaining was between rival technocrats competing to manage the status quo most efficiently. That illusion has long crumbled. Ideology is back. Chaos is commonplace, and again and again, the fabric of our institutional politics appears to be coming apart at the seams. Now, that was true before the arrival of a generation-defining global pandemic, and of course, it's truer now than ever. In Britain, when the age of crisis is analysed for us on television and in the papers, it's usually images of Westminster that we're shown, and it's primarily politicians' voices that we hear. My journalism and the book that I'm here to talk about today tries to tell a different story. It travels not to the great citadels of power, but to the margins instead. The places that lie off the edge of the page, uh, the shady corners into which news cameras rarely reach. And it argues that it's the people dwelling in these spaces who can best explain why our present feels so unstable. It believes that if we want to find the future, or at least to understand the struggles that will forge the future, then we must look here. 
And so I'm going to start this evening by talking about someone who is actually at the very heart of the British government, although I doubt many people here will have heard of them. Someone who I think reveals a great deal about where our politics is today, where it's going and what opportunities exist for new forms of political organising that respond to the times we live in. That person's name is Fatima Jallo, and she comes from the West African state of Guinea-Bissau. As a teenager, she dreamed of being a doctor. And when she was 12 years old, Fatima's mother, a single parent who was left to bring up the family alone after Fatima's father was killed in a bicycle accident, sold her rickety camp bed, gave the money to Fatima's older sister and instructed her to take Fatima to the city. She wanted me to study and she ended up sleeping on the floor to make that possible, remembers Fatima. To this day, I'm the only one of my siblings who can read or write. The journey west from Sanarco, a small town in the grassy interior of Guinea-Bissau, was 120 miles long and the bus ran once a week. This was the mid-1970s in the early febrile days of a brand new nation on Africa's Atlantic coastline that had just fought a bitter war of independence against the Portuguese. The roads were hard and often dangerous, but Fatima wasn't scared. Not really. The fear inside her got crowded out by the thrill. She'd grown up in a place where life was often difficult and food, healthcare and education scarce. Her father had been an informal tradesman, purchasing bits and bobs where he could and selling them on to anyone who would take them. Her mother cooked for locals in a kitchen. Her sisters would soon be married off. One would go on to have 14 children. And so for Fatima, this ticket to Bissau the bustling port capital of Guinea-Bissau, was a doorway onto a future that was foggy, but different. At first, things went well. Fatima enjoyed her lessons and she adjusted to a world far removed from her old home. But when it came to choosing specialist courses and preparing for an adult career, that wasn't enough. Becoming a doctor meant studying medicine and studying medicine meant lots of extra school fees that Fatima and her family just didn't have. So instead, Fatima became a secretary, typing by day and living frugally by night, saving and saving until one day at the age of 17, she had enough money to buy another ticket to a different future, this time consisting of a plane to Lisbon. I didn't know anyone in Portugal, Fatima told me. My plan was to finally get the chance to study further, but it didn't work out. She ended up doing low paid work to survive on this unfamiliar continent and eventually started a family of her own. Still, that lure of an alternative existence, somewhere else, just over the horizon, one more door away, endured. In 2008, in the thick of the global financial crisis, Fatima folded up her life yet again and made her way to London. She knew it would be tough, like Lisbon was, and Bissau before it, and Sanarco before that. Because ultimately, she told me, everywhere is tough, even if the shape and texture of that toughness varies from place to place, and the strain feels differently against your skin. But I thought things would be better, she said. I wanted to become a bus driver. Bus drivers, you see, have secure jobs, and they get to explore vast portions of the city, they're a highly visible part of the urban infrastructure and everyone can see how much they're needed. I had lots of hopes when I arrived here, Fatima smiled, but that's life. Nothing works out as you planned. For the past decade, far from exploring vast portions of the city, Fatima has run on rails. She wakes up in the early hours of the morning to be in with a chance of being able to use the bathroom at her small house in Stratford, East London which she shares with nine strangers. Some are Italian, she thinks, and some might be Eastern European, but nobody socializes with one another as they're all too busy working, so she can't really be sure. Almost every possession that Fatima owns remains permanently packed in two large suitcases because she knows what the landlord is capable of. He demands payments in cash and he retains a personal key to everybody's bedroom. I have my creams and my hair products out on the side table, and that's it, she explained to me. When he throws me out onto the street, I'll be ready. By 6.30 in the morning, Fatima's on the tube, 
and heading to the Ministry of Justice headquarters near St. James's Park for the first of two jobs. Over the next nine hours, she will walk up and down 16 floors of UK government office space, cleaning each of the male and female toilets on every floor five times per working day. She will walk for miles and miles until 5 p.m. when she'll gather her things, walk down the road for half a mile more and begin another set of cleaning rounds, this time at the Supreme Court. For all of this, she gets paid just above the legal minimum wage for her age. By the time she gets home, it's past 9 p.m. and she's exhausted. She spends her weekends at home, queuing up to use the house's only washing machine and catching up on sleep. And then on Monday, she'll start all over again. It isn't any kind of life, she told me. But on the day I interviewed Fatima, she was living a very different kind of life. On that day, a wet August afternoon back in 2018, she was on strike for a living wage, spinning in the middle of a Westminster pavement as rain poured from the sky with glitter on her face and strips of ticker tape in her hair. She was blowing on a horn. She was dancing deliriously, flanked by a line of security guards on one side and a line of police officers on the other. The air was fat with music and shouting and flare smoke and promise. And Fatima, now aged 54, was at the heart of it all, walking through yet another doorway into the unknown. Now Fatima, a low paid migrant outsourced cleaner, was once the kind of worker that traditional trade unions wrote off as being impossible for them to reach and organize. She and her colleagues were too insecure, too fragmented by shift patterns and linguistic barriers, too hidden behind casual temporary contracts and third party agencies. But today, thanks to changes in our economy that have taken place over the past four decades, and which intensified particularly in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, workers like Fatima are increasingly not an exception, but the norm. Even before coronavirus, Britain's workers were poorer than ever. Since 2008, real wages in the UK have fallen by a percentage point every year. By the mid 2010s, the typical worker here was earning 10% less than they were before 2008. Compare that to average wage rises in that period of 11% in France, 14% in Germany, and 23% in Poland. This is now the most protracted fall in working incomes since the Napoleonic Wars. Seven in 10 workers in the UK are chronically broke, according to a major study by the Royal Society of Arts, while 7 million people in Britain today living below the breadline that's two thirds of all of those in poverty are in jobs, but jobs that simply don't pay enough. And as well as being poorer, Britain's workers are more insecure. Up to 10 million people are now estimated to be in some form of precarious work, a trend that stretches well beyond the newfangled gig economy and into occupations that have existed for centuries, like teaching, caring and hospitality as well as traditionally high status professional occupations, which are witnessing growing casualization among entry level graduates, part of a process that some are calling the proletarianization of the professional classes, especially among the young. To give some idea of where all those 10 million insecure precarious workers are, the cleaning sector in which Fatima works alone employs no less than 700,000 people in the UK, which is all a long way of saying that Fatima is part of a precarious workforce that is already hugely dominant in our current economy, which is expanding fast, and that what matters to her, the decisions that she takes about how to navigate this moment of political flux, this febrile cocktail of both immiseration and opportunity, those decisions matter to us all. And so in my book, I tell the story of Fatima's transformation into what she was on that wet August afternoon on the pavements of Westminster, a trade union organiser and fearless strike leader who against all the odds had marched out of the place on multiple occasions with most of her colleagues behind her.
most powerful state and private institutions in this country to listen. And I tell the story, too, of the workers' movements that helped make those strikes happen, in particular, an organisation called United Voices of the World, or UVW for short, one of a new breed of insurgent grassroots trade unions made up of workers that the older legacy unions had often given up on, but whose lived experience of work in this age of crisis has educated them and radicalised them into taking direct action. UVW, which is democratically run by its own members, which has existed for less than a decade, and whose entire annual budget is less than the single salary of Len McCluskey, uh, who is General Secretary of Unite, Britain's biggest trade union. UVW has won victory after victory in recent years, driving up wages and securing better rights for low paid, invisible workers everywhere, from multinational banks uh, at Canary Wharf to NHS hospitals, and even delightfully and ironically, the offices of the Daily Mail. They've done it by being unabashedly loud, confrontational and political, linking their members' struggles at work explicitly with wider but interrelated issues like the cost of housing and systemic racism. As one of UVW's senior organisers once told me, we're a fighting members-led union because through us, our members are struggling to be active agents in their workplace and beyond, to redefine their relationship, not just with their bosses, but also with the city they live in and the communities around them. When it comes to analysing and explaining the age of crisis, the politics that got us here, the battles being waged over what comes next, you won't find many mentions of Fatima or UVW in the media. Why does that matter? Well, let's just take a moment to frame the wider crisis that I'm talking about. We know that in 2008, the economic paradigm, which has molded Britain and much of the planet beyond it for 40 years, a set of principles based around free markets, movable money and competition imploded. It didn't die altogether, not least because those in power moved heaven and earth to stitch it back together, using audacious innovations to drive it forward harder and faster than ever before. But the justifications offered up for that system's existence no longer chimed with the lived reality of millions. Basic protections that many had come to expect from the state were stripped away, and for many more, the fundamental components of a decent life, a secure job, a secure home, a sense of one's place in the world, those things drifted further and further out of reach. New divisions emerged between those whose existing assets or status were swollen by this latest aggressive iteration of capitalism and those who were impoverished by it. By the end of the last decade, growth in life expectancy was stalling for the first time in 100 years. Average household debt had hit record highs and 135,000 children were homeless at Christmas. In the gap between the mindset of a sclerotic governing class and the daily experiences of its citizens, we also know that in the years following the financial crisis, and particularly during the last half decade or so in the UK, rebellions began to take root. These rebellions came from the left and the right, from the young and the old. They manifested themselves at the ballot box, on the ground, in a, in a vast array of different forms. The result was two highly contentious referendums that convulsed the country, three general elections in quick succession, which threw up wildly differing results, and the slow motion unravelling of our elite organs of governance, once an international byword for endurance and stability. For better or for worse, all of this tumult has expanded our shared sense of political possibility Britain has recently come within a few thousand votes of putting a radical socialist administration into office and has also just delivered a landslide victory to the most right-wing government of the modern era. Yet, to most of those whom we rely upon to navigate the political landscape on our behalf, all these shocks and surprises have appeared utterly mystifying. In search of answers, reporters and pundits 
converged on Whitehall, Downing Street and the House of Commons. In other words, the site of the symptoms rather than the causes. The coverage was breathless. We had hung parliaments and legislative deadlock, constitutional bedlam and fallen prime ministers. But at the heart of it all, there was an epic absence, or at least it seemed like that to me. The politics presented to us was commentated on like a sporting event, a spectacle played out by a select few over there, something for the rest of us to watch from our sofas and boo or cheer. There was rarely any notion conveyed of how all this turmoil was entangled with politics in its wider, deeper form, a living thing that runs through Fatima as much as it runs through all of us. Politics is something which alters ordinary people and which ordinary people in turn are capable of altering for themselves. The economics writer Aditya Chakraborty back in 2019 noted, what a funny contained emergency it is. It's as if the revolution of 1789 was being covered entirely from inside the Versailles court of Louis XVI. In my work more generally, and in this book specifically, I try to do something very different. On one level, the book comprises a journey, which is my search for that wider, deeper politics, one that sent me out to franchised coffee outlets and nondescript office blocks all over the country, clambering across mammoth construction sites and factory ruins, wedging myself into basements, squats and the shadows of glitzy conference halls, walking along fields, rivers, football pitches and far-flung business parks, hunting through the landscape all the while for clues. On another level, the book is an alternative history of our ongoing disorder, narrated by those who too often find themselves being talked about rather than listened to. And it's also, I hope, an intervention at a moment when things are falling apart and the outlines of the next paradigm remain unclear, the book makes an argument about how we should be sifting through the rubble and the sort of fights that must be won if we're to construct a fairer, better future. At the core of this argument is a simple claim that after a long stretch in which we were told wrongly that politics was resolved, the years to come will in fact be marked by agitation and opportunity and that far from being passengers on a grim ride that we can't get off from, we're all political agents with a crucial part to play in determining where we go from here. And I think the best people to teach us this are people like Fatima, people at the sharp end of the age of crisis, who have found new means of demanding our attention and of bending politics to their will. The organizations I write about in the book are relatively small in and of themselves, and they congregate in crevices from a dank club night in Brighton to a tower block in Kensington to a shabby shop front in Scotland, almost 400 miles north. But the various communities they represent, such as precarious workers, are huge and growing. Their concerns are our shared concerns, and their next steps will affect us all. Many of these movements, like UVW, relate to the world of work because that offers a particularly stark example of the ways in which new forms of exploitation, which drive insecurity for workers, are also generating new means of political struggle. In the book, I mention Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, which some of you might be familiar with. It was published more than a century ago in 1906, and it journeyed into the dark underbelly of the American food industry and explored the indignities and abuses imposed upon workers by the factory assembly line, a relatively new innovation in mass production at the time that was relentlessly engineered to, in Sinclair's words, use everything about the hog except the squeal. Sinclair, feel, uh, sorry, Sinclair feared that the assembly line would destroy the collective power of the working class people who manned it, that it would homogenize and de-skill industrial labor, handing technical control of production to managers and making it easier to draft in reserve armies of casual staff, all the while driving up profits for capital. But in reality, the assembly line did not result in a collapse 
in labour militancy. In fact, the opposite occurred. By the mid-1930s, when a huge strike wave roiled America's auto industry, it was clear that this emerging technology also provided workers with new pressure points to exploit, new opportunities to disrupt. After the great sit-in at the General Motors plant in Flint, Michigan in late 1936, which lasted for 44 days and saw workers using hinges and bolts from the factory floor to fend off armed police who were trying to seize it, it became apparent that in the age of the assembly line, even a small number of labour activists in a single plant were capable of bringing production to a halt, and that gumming up operations in one location had a knock-on effect across a company's entire corporate empire. As at every stage of capitalism's evolution, new modes of economic production have simultaneously created new forms of ex exploitation and new forms of resistance, both of them drawing on the same tools. And you can see that same dynamic reflected today in the rise of, say, algorithmic management. The work of most Deliveroo riders and Uber drivers, for example, is governed almost entirely by the company's smartphone software. In fact, their only physical contact with the firms comes when they initially sign up. And even then, it's likely to involve nothing more than a meeting with another precarious worker who's been brought in on a temporary contract to staff the recruitment centre. Upton Sinclair described a world of work in which figures of authority were ever present on the assembly line, quote, ranged in ranks and grades like an army, managers and superintendents and foremen, each one driving the man next below him and trying to squeeze out of him as much work as possible. Fast forward 100 years, and that process of oversight has now, for many workers, been entirely automated. It's the app itself that assigns the jobs, that records and ranks performance, which delivers feedback in the form of both incentives and discipline. So what possible hope is there now for workers seeking to act in concert with one another and assert their labour power and challenge their managers? Well, the answer is plenty. In the book, I recount what happened in the summer of 2016 when Deliveroo uh, unilaterally announced a series of changes to its pay structure for riders, who then used WhatsApp to coordinate a wildcat strike. One by one, the riders began logging off from the app, traveling from neighborhood to neighborhood through the places where their fellow riders would congregate, waiting for orders, picking them up along the way, and then converging together on the company's headquarters in central London. Their bosses, meanwhile, have no idea what's going on because there are no supervisors or foremen on the ground. And they receive the fright of their lives. As far as they're concerned, suddenly with no explanation, couriers all over London have disappeared from the map only to reappear in person en masse right outside their office window. And it gets even better because soon Uber Eats riders are following suit and taking advantage of a loophole in their app's design whereby new customers get a five pound signing up discount on any order. So the Uber Eats couriers begin creating dozens and dozens of fake new accounts, using that promotional credit to order a free meal to be delivered to the spot in the city where they gathered. And then as each new courier arrives with the food, they would welcome them to the picket line, inform them about the fight back and encourage them to join the action too and log out. Sure enough, a few days later, thanks to the sustained pressure of those workers, the controversial pay changes were reversed. Delivery riders, government cleaners, McDonald's workers, Weatherspoon's pint pullers, low paid staff at Sports Direct, Addison Lee, the Picture House cinema chain, City Sprint couriers, the catering giant Compass, the pathology service provider TDL, the University of London, the Royal College of Music, the Royal Opera House, the National Gallery. There is literally no area of the economy that has been left untouched by a wave of largely underreported low paid labour protest in the past few years. No product you've bought, no service you've used, no cultural event you've enjoyed that doesn't, if you unspool and follow the threads that lie behind it, have a recent workers' confrontation knotted deep within its ecosystem. 
And of course, the world of work is only one among many domains in which the age of crisis is fermenting new political activity. Housing, or the lack of it, is another, with secure, affordable homes now effectively out of reach for a generation. In the mid-1980s, it took the average young couple in outer London three years to save up a housing deposit. And more than half of 25 to 34-year-olds owned their own home. Today, it takes the average young couple in outer London 19 years to save up a housing deposit. And just 16% of 25 to 34-year-olds own their own home. With the social housing stock diminished and hugely oversubscribed, that means that most young people are forced into the largely unregulated private rental market, where on current trends, they're likely to remain for much of their lives. The number of privately renting households with children has tripled in just over a decade, from 600,000 in the mid 2000s to 1.8 million in 2016 half of today's young people will be paying private landlords well into their 40s. One in three will still be renting privately when they're pensioners. This is a story of accumulation by dispossession, the accumulation by existing property owners of unprecedented wealth gains over the past decade, at least on paper, aided by successive government failures to tackle the housing crisis and the impact of the quantitative easing programme, which has vastly inflated the value of fixed assets at the expense of those who rely on wages and social spending, and the dispossession of all those forced to hand over often up to half their income in rent to landlords each month. Landlords who still have the right to evict them on a whim with only two months notice. So what's emerged from this aspect of the crisis? Well, the answer is another form of organising that was often assumed to be impossible in this country, namely tenants unions, such as ACORN, which operates nationally, and the London Renters Union, which is based in the capital, both of whom are pioneering new ways for private renters to act collectively in fighting for their rights, in holding landlords to account, and in resisting egregious rent rises. And that's another major focus of the book. So too are the migrant collectives challenging the hostile environment regime. And indeed, because new forms of organising that take advantage of this moment of expanded political possibility in the age of crisis are not solely the preserve of the left, far from it, so too are far right movements, especially those gaining ground in post-industrial areas of Britain, where there's been a mainstream narrative void regarding why some communities have been so disadvantaged by modern market liberalism, a void which has been filled very successfully by the hard right and sometimes even proto-fascistic extremists. And of course, running through the whole book are the experiences of young people today, the first generation in a hundred years who are set to end up poorer than their parents. A young generation saddled from the outset of adulthood with obscene levels of student debt, who can't afford decent housing, who are doomed to enter an increasingly insecure world of work, and who most importantly aren't sure whether or not they'll have a habitable planet to live on by the time they reach old age. As one of the organisers of the school climate strikes told me, and whom I quote in the book, These kids have a hugely radical understanding of the way that politics works, and they recognise that our democratic processes and structures as they stand are designed to uphold the status quo. These are the children of the financial crisis, who know they'll be worse off than their parents, who know that they'll never own a home, and who know that on current trends they might live to see the end of humanity. So for them, for us, politics is not a game, it's reality. And that's reflected in the way we organise, relentlessly, radically, as if our lives depend on it. In my opinion, to really understand the multiple intersecting crises enveloping us, to really untangle and tease out where that pervasive sense of uncertainty and upheaval comes from, and to do so not just as an academic exercise, but as a means of influencing our trajectory, as a means of acting politically, These are the stories we need to tell, and these are the voices we need to listen to. The cultural theorist Stuart Hall 
once said, and it's an observation that resonates with me incredibly strongly. There are always energies, people, societies on the margin, those who can't express themselves within the dominant structure. What is to come will come as a result of those forces who are outside beginning to trouble, undermine, subvert, and haunt the nightmares of the present, just at the moment when the present thinks it's closed. That haunting is all around us today. And it's what so many of those who have never bumped up against the hard edges of the status quo fail to understand. What comes next in a way that actually seemed almost inconceivable in the relatively staid and consensual days of the mid 2000s has in recent years become open wide and up for grabs. That then is the political terrain upon which coronavirus landed earlier this year. And COVID, of course, has unleashed a new set of social catastrophes that are nested inside a great many existing social ca catastrophes, like a Russian doll. What we've realized in our attempts to hold back the pandemic is that tackling it has involved exposing all of them to the light. All of these social catastrophes, including low pay, including the housing crisis, including racial inequalities. The disease's transmission lines have often proved to be the very cracks I write about in the book and that we've been talking about this evening. Poverty, precariousness, the insecurity of not having a dependable roof over one's head and our instinctive responses to it, such as the establishment of local mutual aid groups, they draw on the very forms of self-organized politics that I explore in the book as well. It's no surprise that polling suggests only 9% of people in Britain declare a uh, uh, sorry, desire a complete return to normal after COVID-19. This pandemic has forced all of us to contemplate the kind of questions articulated by Fatima and others like her in the book. Questions regarding the extent to which we think of ourselves as part of a collective. Questions about what it truly means to be safe or free. And so I just want to begin winding up by reflecting briefly on how Fatima and her cleaning colleagues at the Ministry of Justice have experienced coronavirus so far. And it's a subject I've written about in a few standalone pieces of journalism this summer, which I think help illuminate the nature of the new politics that we've been talking about. Most of you will remember, I'm sure, the dramatic moment on March 23rd, when Boris Johnson addressed the nation and announced from this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction, you must stay home. Uh, not least because we're getting another update, uh, I think as we speak from Boris now. Now the first thing to say is that for Fatima and the rest of the outsourced cleaners, that lockdown never existed. Although nearly all of the ministry's civil servants and administrative staff switched to working from home, the cleaners were designated as key workers and ordered to continue coming in as normal. Shorn of support or guidance and often unable to track down their managers and supervisors, who in some cases had switched to working from home themselves, the cleaners tried to ask questions about PPE and workplace safety. Uh, workplace safety sorry. And most importantly, they asked about occupational sick pay, something that none of the cleaners received. Fatima and her colleagues pointed out that with most of the cleaners living on the poverty line, as it is, anyone needing to self-isolate due to su suspected coronavirus would probably be unable to do so unless occupational sick pay was granted to them. Statutory sick pay of just under £96 a week is simply not enough even to cover basic rent. And as a result, those that were ill would be forced to come in and risk infecting others. Their bosses, uh, both at OCS, which is the outsourcing giant which employs them, it's privately owned by the Goodliffe family, uh, who according to the Sunday Times Rich List are worth almost 200 million pounds. The bosses there and at the Ministry of Justice either shifted responsibility between each other or declined to respond to the cleaners' concerns at all. 
an investigation into this carried out by myself and by some colleagues over many weeks and which collected dozens of hours of corroborated worker testimony, as well as a cache of leaked documents and emails, revealed multiple occasions upon which the cleaners brought up their anxieties only to be fobbed off or lied to or ignored. As Britain braced for disaster, these so-called key workers were left to fend for themselves. It was scary and depressing, remembers Fatima, of those early eerie days when the computer people, as she calls the ministry's office workers, had nearly all disappeared and the security guards were the only other faces to be seen on site. Benito Medina, a 40-year-old cleaner from the Canary Islands, told me that he panicked on his first encounter with mile upon mile of deserted corridors. You have this fear that something bad is going to happen to you, he told me. And something bad did happen. Circulating in small teams through a near deserted building, sweeping carpets that had not been walked upon and wiping down desks that were not being used, the cleaners began to fall ill with COVID-like symptoms exactly as they had feared one after another, with no official support network to help them when they needed help the most. Those compelled by hardship to work felt terrified, while those that took it upon themselves to obey the official guidelines and self-isolate at home were either stripped of their pay or dismissed. They told us nothing, says Florencio Hurtado, a night shift worker who, like most of his colleagues, juggles several outsourced cleaning jobs to make ends meet, often clocking up more than 80 working hours a week. Quote, at no moment did anybody say anything to us about being allowed to stay at home. And for most of us, there was no way to stay at home anyway, because if we don't work, we don't get paid. And this is London. Life is difficult and very expensive. So people carried on coming in, even though they felt sick. I was one of them. We had no choice. End quote. By late April, with several of the cleaners struck down with suspected coronavirus, some extremely seriously, United Voices of the World, that's Fatima's trade union, wrote a formal letter to both OCS and to Robert Buckland's QC, who is the Secretary of State for Justice, setting out major concerns over the way workers were being treated during the pandemic and accusing OCS of taking no meaningful action to protect the health of cleaners. The letter warns that the consequences of this were potentially deadly and concluded, the cleaners believe they are putting themselves and others in serious, imminent and unavoidable danger. OCS responded to UVW's official complaint several days later, insisting that the company was operating in full compliance with Public Health England guidelines and had been working hard to protect the well-being of its staff. The reply came too late. By that point, not one, but two outsourced workers at the Ministry of Justice who had fallen sick were already dead. One of them, just like Fatima, was a migrant cleaner from Guinea-Bissau. His name was Emmanuel Gomez. He died aged 43 years old, leaving behind a wife and children. And out of fear of losing both his pay and his job, if he took any time off, he had continued to come into work up to and including the night before he died, despite having a fever, despite barely being able to stand. When his fellow cleaners saw him that night as he came into his shift and suggested that they call him an ambulance, he refused and insisted that he had to work. After eventually allowing himself to be taken home on public transport, he was so dizzy and disorientated that according to a colleague, when they reached Victoria Station, the station that Emmanuel passed through every single day, Emmanuel had no idea where he was. I won't go into the full details of that story now because we don't have time. I'm very happy to discuss it further during the Q&A if people are interested. And anyone is also free to check out the original investigation, which was published as a long read on the slow news platform Tortoise. The, the scandal of what happened at the Ministry of Justice uh, in relation to coronavirus was subsequently brought up in Parliament, forcing a government climb down. It is now belatedly providing full sick pay for cleaners like Fatima if they have to self-isolate due to coronavirus.
And I should add that the Ministry of Justice denies any wrongdoing. You can hear their side of the story as far as it goes in the full piece. OCS, the outsourcing company, has refused to comment at all on any of these re revelations, and you can read into that what you will. But the reason I wanted to flag this up here is that what Fatima and her colleagues went through this year underscores, I think, the point I've been making about the new forms of politics that are arising from the age of crisis, a dynamic that the pandemic is exacerbating. The virus itself may not discriminate between humans, but the nation that it's wreaked havoc on most certainly does. A nation fractured by inequalities, but one in which the contours of power and opportunity are actually more malleable than might first appear. The only reason we're aware of the coronavirus scandal at the Ministry of Justice this year is that the cleaners themselves strive to pull all the threads together and spoke out. The week after Emmanuel's death in late April, on International Workers Memorial Day, appropriately enough, Fatima and several of her colleagues walked unilaterally off the job. They've since forced their employer into crucial concessions both the Ministry of Justice and OCS are now facing a variety of legal claims and UVW, the trade union, has just made history by winning a formal recognition agreement for the first time at a government department. We beat their union busting and we won our rights, Fatima told me. It's us that has to go into the Ministry of Justice each day looking for the virus, trying to clean it, trying to chase it away. I think they believe we're drones, that our lives aren't worth anything. I don't know why. Maybe it's because we're foreigners. All we wanted was decent information. All we wanted was to be treated as human beings. Now we go for full victory. The point is that, yes, the age of crisis is creating uncertainty. And yes, it's driving insecurity and deepening divisions. And yet from that morass, from that chaos, that fills the air around us. New forms of hope, a new politics is out there and is beginning to take shape. And that the tools are in our hands to fight for the Britain that we want to see. We're not condemned to be mere spectators at the end of the old world. However much our diet of frenzied 24 hour rolling, usually grim news makes us feel like that. If Fatima can seize this moment to organise and to assert her presence, to shape things, then so can I and so can you. I'll end with this. In the American South of the 1930s and 40s, legions of baseball correspondents filed scrupulously balanced articles detailing the highlights of each match, the transfers from one team to another, the internal dramas that formed the backbone of every season. With very few exceptions, none of them ever commented on the fact that US baseball leagues were racially segregated at this time, or that the informal baseball color line was actually being progressively undermined by a nascent civil rights movement that would go on to change the country's history. Those correspondents operated within the boundaries of the system they reported on and rarely questioned its underlying structure or the wider social mobilizations that were already rendering it an anachronism, albeit in a different context. I think that something similar has characterized political journalism here in recent years. The UK press is sometimes described as suffering from a lack of diversity and the charge is a fair one, but it doesn't only apply to the racial, gender and class backgrounds of its personnel. Crucially, the media has also failed to diversify its thinking, to move beyond the narrow confines and limited horizons of the political assumptions that came before. By and large, I think that journalists have failed to seek out those who understand the age of crisis and the new politics arising from it because they live it day in and day out for themselves. I hope that the book, which is here, I'm a precarious millennial, so I'll go for a, a very cheeky uh, you know, book plug. Do buy a copy for your friends. Um, I hope that the book and that this talk provide something of a small corrective 
And in the process that it sketches out the beginnings of a struggle for tomorrow that is fraught, yes, with danger, but also with possibility. As the author Rebecca Solnit puts it in one of my very favorite quotes, the future is dark with a darkness as much of the womb as the grave. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. That was, uh, that was very clear signposting to uh, a potential future there. Thank you. Um, so if you do have questions, no one's put any questions in the Q&A section. If you do have a question for Jack, either do that or raise your hand or just let us know somehow that you'd like to ask something. Um, yeah, so you, I got the impression you travelled quite a lot to uh, sort of meet these people and get their stories. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, it's ironic that I began uh, today with a story about someone who, as I said, is obviously at the very heart of, of Westminster. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're literally working inside a government building. Uh, but the idea behind the book was really to get away from SW1, you know, the postcode in which uh, the House of Commons and Whitehall and mm. uh, 10 Downing Street is located, precisely because, uh, in my experience, you know, this, this, this period of such unprecedented flux and uh, turmoil, uh, this real upheaval that has pervaded all our lives in the past few years, was not being adequately explained to me when I picked up a newspaper uh, or looked on the news. And as I said, the voices that I was hearing were not the people who I felt could really explain the crisis. So I knew that to, to get at those stories, I needed to move um, certainly outside of those kind of circles. Yeah. And often that in, included, you know, physically, geographically, getting out to different places. So the book has chapters um, based around different themes, but set in places as diverse as Tilbury, uh, which is a port town um, on the Thames in Essex, in fact, just across the river from where I am now, uh, down to Brighton in the south and Glasgow in the north, and uh, many, many different places in between from rapidly urbanizing uh, cities uh, where there are lots of money and financialization uh, like Manchester to areas kind of north of Newcastle in Northumberland which tell a very different story of uh, sort of post-industrial decline and I hope that between them uh, they give if not an exhaustive it's certainly not an exhaustive then at least a thought-provoking kind of overview of the political landscape that we're all navigating mm at the moment. Okay, right, we have some questions in. Um, first person with their hand up thing was Emma Co. is that? Emma, I don't know if you're ready to ask a question. Yes, Hi, I, I've muted myself, can you hear me? Can. Yes, yes I can. Uh, brilliant, I just want to say Jack, thank you so much, that was just amazing. And uh, oh, I actually you. cheered uh, when you said the story about the Uber Eats and the delivery drivers. I was like, good, great. <laughs> Thank you um, so much. Oh, it's a, I mean, I'm kind of slightly weeping as well, but I just have a question. I mean, the Ministry of Justice uh, story you were talking about, which is hugely ir ironic that it's the Ministry of Justice and so Absolutely. much injustice is happening there. But do you think that the culture that allows the cleaners like Emmanuel on their watch or the night managers to die because of essentially budget, cost cutting, they outsource that company will out, you know, cost cut, what have you. Do you think that the culture of that kind of thinking comes right from the top? Or is it literally a level of middle manager bureaucr bureaucrats who in some ways are kind of to blame, but are also not to blame because they're also fearful for their own jobs, mm. albeit that they are on a much better setting, footing than Emmanuel and Fatima? Because there's just something about going to bed at night and defending when somebody dies on your watch, it's not our it's not our problem, Gov. Sorry, um, and and I just wonder what what you're, what you're thinking on that is. But thank you very much. That was amazing. Well, thank you, and thank you um, for that very thoughtful question. Uh, I mean, if I do any more of these um, Zoom talks, I'm going to demand that all of the participants are unmuted, just in case there's a ripple of cheers at any moment, in the unlikely event, because uh, I don't want to miss out on that kind of uh, you know, validation. Um, but, but thank you. It means a lot, uh, your words, and it's a fantastic question and, and a really important one. And I think one that I grapple with often because... 
when I am writing about and reporting um, these particular examples of injustices and then trying to root them in a kind of wider analytical framing, I'm often moving between sort of two modes of outrage, one of which is a bit more personalized and is a bit more moralized where there are individuals that I am writing about or, or trying to interview or trying to hold to account, often putting questions through, you know, PR officers and, and, and press officers saying, you know, why did this happen on this meeting on this day? Why were these concerns ignored? And I do hold the individuals uh, uh, who are involved in the OCS and the MOJ contract absolutely individually to account. However, politically, I almost think that um, that as a focus for our energies is a waste of time. Um, the reality of why Emmanuel and Fatima, um, who thankfully, as far as she knows, wasn't one of the uh, cleaners who felt ill with coronavirus. The reason that they live in the precarity that they do, the reason why their wages are so low, the reasons why their kind of financial security levels are so absent and why they feel uh, so compelled to come into work um, even when they're suffering the symptoms of, 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 of a deadly virus uh, goes to the economic system that we live under and the principles that uh, this government continues to believe even though it has become more expansionist and more high spending in the COVID era because of because of the crisis um, of the pandemic. Nonetheless, the principle of this government is that it believes in a lean state. It believes in stripping excess capacity out of the system. It believes in slashing budgets wherever possible. That is at the heart of its program for government. And when you have a program for government like that, and remember, you know, this is a um, this is a government that's been in power for 10 years and actually many of its economic principles, and this is something that I look at a lot in the book, were also uh, you know, prevalent in the new Labour era. Um, and the, you know, the, 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 what stripping out that spare capacity looks like is the lives of people like Emmanuel and Fatima. So absolutely, we need to keep our eyes is on the big picture um, and this particular moment of uh, the pandemic and of us all thinking about what it means to keep ourselves safe and free uh, in, in, in a time of crisis like this, it's a particularly opportunistic time to be having those arguments and to be fighting back. There were fantastic banner drops by a series of activists um, on council estates and in local communities around the country at the start of the pandemic during lockdown, which said, no one is safe until we are all safe. Now that works both as a metaphor uh, and also quite literally, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a public health crisis where one person getting infected puts everyone at risk, uh, it has a literal truth as well. And I think we can carry some of those messages that Fatima uh, and her colleagues have exposed to us and have and have, have taken forward for us and carry them forward into this wider political moment, making that point that having people on that level of low pay and financial insecurity, having an economy resting on that kind of system is simply not sustainable and cannot hold and we won't accept it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got three questions. We will get to all three of you because I believe we've got time. Um, I'm going to do them slightly out of order that, as they were came in because um, Norman has a question next and uh, it sort of follows on from the previous one. So, hi Norman, are you there? Yes, I am. <clears throat> um, hi Norman. Yeah, the, 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 the question is really about, um, the, the, I mean, the law states that you're supposed to have um, holiday pay and you know there's at least statutory sick pay um and uh you know now you have to have you know there's compulsory pension contributions and things like that so how presumably the the ministry of justice and other other places like this are getting round the uh the law themselves effectively by using ocs but um are they do they know that they're doing this and just as a corollary to something you were saying about this, this um, uh, in answer to the last question, 
about the um, uh, cost cutting, total cost cutting mm -hmm. um, uh, approach to government uh, by government. Um, I mean, the the, uh, the the failure, but the you know the use of the old uh, version of Excel that failed the um, track and trace stuff. That um, my experience from working for Public Health England is exactly that that approach that they had, which meant that nobody would authorise buying a new copy of Excel when they had a copy of Excel, even though it might cause the whole system to crash. Uh, but uh, that that's just a sort of s side comment. But yeah, sorry. No, thank you, Norman. I, I really appreciate that. I mean, the fact is that it is not the case in this country that it's the law that employers provide occupational sick pay. Um, as you say, there are conditions about um, pensions, contributions for, for, for permanent employees, and there are uh, kind of legal baselines in terms of holiday pay. When it comes to sick pay, the, the baseline is statutory sick pay, which is uh, just under £96 a week. Um, and there are, I think, very few people in the country who would be able to live on £96 a week. Certainly, if you are renting in London, yeah. uh, it is an absolute impossibility to live on £96 a week. Now, it is, I mean, this, this, this goes back to, to Emma's question about who, who do you blame? Um, one, of the, one of the skills of um, these outsourcing companies, some of whom are absolutely huge multinationals. I mean, people will have heard of Carillon, of course, which famously clapped. But companies like G4S and, of course, Serco, very much in the news at the moment. But there are many, many others um, who are not household names and they don't want to be household names. Uh, because they don't want a sort of consumer facing kind of brand image precisely for reasons like this. And the entire edifice of outsourcing is in part about allowing uh, organizations and companies that do have uh, uh, an outward facing kind of public image to outsource all of those difficult things and to outsource all of those forms of exploitation and I would argue essentially abuse of workers to a company that is off the radar and as I say we have the um, we have the email trail um, leaked to us as part of our investigation showing workers emailing their bosses saying look you know and I'm paraphrasing here but you know we don't have any PPE we haven't had any guidance we don't understand why are we coming in when there's nothing to clean why are we being told that um, you know we, 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 we can't stay home and why are we not been given basic health and safety advice and we see we've got the answers on, on from those emails from the OCS managers who are then saying well this isn't really our responsibility we're taking our guidance from the Ministry of Justice because you know they are our client they set the terms and conditions and of course any cleaner that goes to an, a manager at the Ministry of Justice will be told well you don't work for us you work for OCS so it's a very deliberate uh, way of blurring lines of responsibility both for the workers themselves and in terms of, you know, when scandals like this erupt, uh, you know, the fallout. Um, do I think that uh, there will be changes in the long run? I, you know, at the moment, I genuinely do not see uh, this government, uh, you know, and perhaps things, perhaps things will change because there will be a real kind of uptick of public anger over the way in which the most insecure in our society have been treated. Um, but I do not see this government, however many millions or billions they set aside for kind of economic reconstruction programs, fundamentally shifting their philosophy that these kind of things are best left to the market and that uh, it's the job of government to get out of the way. That is the economic paradigm, which, as I say, has shaped Britain for most of the past 40 years. I would include, as I say, the, the, the New Labour years within that, although I accept that New Labour had a different approach and wanted to redistribute the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, fruits of free market liberalism a little bit more and skim off the top of it, as it were. But my point is that that, that that kind of third way centrism as a form of checking the excesses of the market has failed, has failed as a political ideology. And this is what it looks like once that facade has been ripped back. We need to build something new from the rubble. 
And that is what the book is about, you know, rethinking this stuff from the bottom upwards and looking at the individuals and the communities that I think are at the forefront of that. Yes, Jack, our next question is from Ruth, um, who's got something to ask you. Are, you. are you there, Ruth? Should I ask you to read your question now? <coughs> yes. Hello. Uh, yeah, my question is, you don't say that the future needed because of all of this is socialism. Is there a reason for this? That's a great question, Ruth. Thank you very much. I am a socialist. I'm very happy to call myself a socialist. Um, I think the way in which socialism is defined, or rather, I should say, the way it's commonly understood is so variable and means so many different things to different people um, that often when opening up political conversations, you know, that's not necessarily a, the term I use straight off the bat. But to me, socialism is about recognizing that um, markets and a market, in particular, market society in which markets predominate and in which kind of the fundamental logic behind the way in which power and resources are organized in society is based on market principles, that that is not enough, that that is insufficient to meet, uh, you know, the basic levels of security and happiness and commonality, um, which reflect, you know, a world in which we would all like to live in and that we could all potentially thrive in. And certainly a society that is structured primarily by market logics, such as the one we have at the moment, is incompatible with the ongoing survival of this planet uh, or certainly of humanity's place on it. So I have no problem whatsoever uh, uh, defining myself as a socialist. Uh, I think, you know, the, part of the problem is obviously that um, the most recent and very rare attempt that we have had by a uh, a party that actually had a plausible chance of getting into government to brand itself as socialist unapologetically, which is something I, I completely supported, even though I'm not a member of the Labour Party and um, I'm, I'm not kind of beholden to any particular political movement or, 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 uh, or, or party leader or anything like that. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I think, you know, there is a whole chapter in the book, in fact, about the way in which all of this stuff that I'm talking about the age of crisis, the new politics emerging from it, how all of that intersects with parliament and parliamentary politics and institutional politics, particularly, obviously, at the level of Labour and uh, particularly the role of momentum in kind of shaping that Corbynite moment and the positive things that came out of that and some of the limitations and flaws that came out of that and some of the things that we've learned since the general election. Um, I think we need to have uh, there needs to be a, a real effort to reclaim the term socialism within our public discourse um, but I don't get hung up on on particular particular definitions particular uh, terms just because I think it can often be a way of people instantly switching off and and, 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 and shutting down and not engaging in the conversation um, but nonetheless yes as far as as far as socialism, is a form of pushing back against those those market logics that I'm describing. Uh, I am absolutely a socialist and, and proud to call myself one. Good, thank you. Glad we've got that sorted out. Okay, our um, our last our last question is from uh, Aisha. Um, she wanted me to read the her question out, so I'm going to do that. And I think it's a good place to end. Just what can we do more specifically as individuals, for example? what most needs organizing? Fantastic so, question, uh, Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's a, just a simple one to, uh, to finish off on. Um, I think it's, it feels like a absolute cop out to say this first and foremost. Um, but I think genuinely that the most important thing we can do is to reconceptualize this moment that we're living in and our own relation to it. Now, of course, that's not enough. Of course, a load of people sitting at home on a Zoom call, just sort of reframing 
the way in which they think about the last few years of politics in Britain and the morass that we're heading into as we go forward is not going to be enough to um, transform things. Uh, but one of the biggest obstacles that I find when I have political conversations with people is fatalism, is disengagement, is a view of politics that is essentially transactional and consumerist and is not about ideas, is not about transformation. Uh, instead, it's about a zero sum game. Well, if I put this cross on this ballot paper once every four years, what do I get in return? And I think that's a completely understandable approach to have to politics, because that's what we've been told that politics is um, for a generation. You know, the professionalization of politics uh, that has emerged, you know, particularly in the late 90s, um, and that continued, obviously, um, throughout the kind of coalition era, uh, the, the, the whittling down of the horizons of politics to you know, the, the smallest of tweaks, the smallest of managerial shuffles, uh, this notion that politics itself, um, you know, Will, Will Davies, a sociologist, has a fantastic definition for neoliberalism. He says neoliberalism is the disenchantment of uh, politics by economics. The notion that you can seal off great swathes of human life and, and political debate into these vacuums that are solely determined by markets and economic logics and were not the subject of ideological debate anymore. Um, that has been corrosive. I saw it myself um, when at the last election, having said that I'm not a member of a political party, which I aren't, I'm not, uh, it probably won't surprise you to know that at the last election I did go knocking on doors um, for Labour and I went to some really key marginal uh, in the so-called Red Wall, like Crewe, Crewe and Nantwich, um, which was one of the most marginal seats in the country. And I spoke to people there who have been utterly immiserated by 10 years of austerity under this government. And when I asked them about how they were going to vote, they said, well, the problem is they're all the same and uh, voting doesn't change anything. And of course, at the last election, wherever one lands politically in one's personal preferences, the politicians were not all the same and the choices on the ballot paper genuinely had an ideological gulf between them. But for people who have experienced politics as, you know, this trudge to the ballot, this desultory trudge to the ballot box every few years and nothing more, why would, why would this election seem any different? Uh, so, so that's why I say that the most important thing is just for ourselves and then for the people around us, reconceptualizing politics as something active, something in which we have agency, something which, as I said before, transforms ordinary people and which ordinary people are capable of transforming for themselves. So that's the first step. In terms of more practical steps, well, it completely depends who you are, where you are, what communities you move in, whether you're a student, whether you're a worker, whether you are a neighbor, whether you are a tenant, whether you are all of these things. My point in the book is that there are forms of organizing, there are forms of political uh, uh, kind of gathering and movements which are open to you and which want your involvement. Uh, if you can get involved directly, that's fantastic. Join a tenants union, join a precarious trade union, you know, um, uh, you know, join your local mutual aid group, which is a form of kind of organic, self-organized collective politics from the ground. Uh, and it's notable that at a time when, you know, the pandemic began and, you know, the government turned to Serco to run its test and trace system, it was ordinary communities right up and down the country who came together to provide food parcels for one another, to pick up pharmacy, uh, you know, medicine from the pharmacy and so on. But that's where our, our instincts led. Um, but if you can't join those particular organizations for whatever reason, you can support them. You can support them financially, if that's possible. United Voices of the World, the, uh, the, the, the trade union that I mentioned in my talk, uh, if you Google them, you'll find on their webpage options to support regularly or give a one-off uh, donation. Um, but most importantly, as I say, I, you know, I don't think it's about people um, 
making individualist gestures. It's about us thinking collectively and conceptualizing ourselves as part of a collective. Um, and that, that then shaping many of our interactions in our daily life, in our workplace. And next time you have a conversation with someone who's grumbling about how crap everything is or how depressing everything is on the news, by all means nod and agree, take a sip of your tea and then say, so what are we gonna do about it? There's a fantastic um, woman called Shen Batmaz, uh, who, I, who I interview in the book, who's involved with the McStrike movement. That's the McDonald's workers who are, um, in fact, globally now, but including in Britain, walking off the job to fight for a living wage. Again, a workforce that people said you, you'll never be able to organize them. Um, and Shen talks about how, because McDonald's is incredibly anti-union and tries to prevent any unions from forming within its workplaces, it's notorious for that. Shen said she had to be very subtle in her organizing and she would go up to her colleagues whilst they were flipping burgers, whilst they were manning the drive-through. And she would say to them, you know, if you were alive during the time of the suffragettes um, or you know Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement in the US, what do you think you would have done? And of course, everybody says, well, of course, I would have been a suffragette or I would have joined in with the, with the civil rights movement. And uh, as I'm sure most of us on this call would say as well. And Shane would nod and say, great, so what are you doing now? And just that one conversation, just that one way of reframing the way that people look at their current circumstances and uh, the, the world around them was enough to help mobilize first a handful then a few dozen, then a few hundred, and now, as I say, a global movement of McDonald's workers who are among the most precarious, insecure workers in the country and who nonetheless are taking these massive risks to walk out and to fight for their rights. So if any of us can absorb a little bit of that and take that attitude uh, and that framing out with us into the world, then I think at least we'll be making a start. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Um, never mind the ballots. Here's the rest of your life, I think. <laughs> exactly. I should it's get you to work. write all of my slogans, Scott. It's, it's, a, it's an old album from the before times. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jack. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. It's a great evening. It'll be available on YouTube soon enough. Ah, it's me. Um, and join us again. Um, we have a talk on ethics and technology. Uh, Esha, she, I, she did say that she was inspired by your talk. She's just saying again, she found it really inspiring, which is fantastic. Thank you so much, Esha. Our work here is done. And uh, thanks again, everyone. Uh, do check out the Comedy Hall um, website for other events. Uh, like I say, it's our charitable mission to, to put on talks such as this. And um, thank you all very much for your time. And thank you, Jack. Enjoy the rest of rainy, marshy Kent <laughs> while, while you're there. Thank you so much, everyone. I Thank really you. appreciate your time and uh, both inviting me and everybody who came along and attended. Thank you. We appreciate yours too. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Cheers. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.